Oh, hi there. Chalo. Hey now. Hola. And ba weep grana weep mini bong. However you want to say it. Welcome to that Kev One Show. My next guest, well, you're in for a treat, because he's an award-winning author, political insider, and thespian extraordinaire that, that I first met on the set of The Librarians, where he played Abraham Lincoln. Please welcome the great Steve Holgate. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. I hardly recognize myself from uh, your intro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. You have such gravitas and everything. I, I mean, you fit the bill for Abraham Lincoln fully, full on when I met you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I tell people, uh, you know, I'm tall and skinny and of a certain age. I tell people there's a reason I don't do Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I've, yeah, I've been doing the Lincoln program. I've got, uh, I wrote a, a couple of little pieces for myself. One was uh, a full-length two-act thing, and then I wanted something I could take uh, anywhere. I didn't need lights or sound or really even a stage, just a few feet, and... Uh, uh, between the two of them, I've been doing it for, gosh, 24 years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I used to be too young. Now I'm too old. For, for Lincoln? <laughs> yes, yeah. Although my wife still dyes my hair now. I, uh, I need it. It's, it's, it's gray. And, uh, but it's, it's a fun program to do, and it's a real responsibility because you're playing uh, a character that's so important to people. You, you really need to get it just as right as you can. Oh, yeah, no, definitely, no doubt. Um, and you've been 24 plus years, it sounds like. So, I mean, has, has Lincoln always kind of spoke to you, or was it just the resemblance? And then you first kind of went into it and learned more about him, or how'd you first get into that? Well, it was funny. I was in the Foreign Service, mm -hmm. and um, uh, they let you retire at age 50 with 20 years in. And my wife wanted to uh, pick up her career again, and so we decided we would come home. And I thought, well, what will I do? Uh, you know, I was a theater major. I used to do a lot of theater. And uh, I suppose if I wrote a play for myself, nobody could refuse to cast me. And, uh, and a lot of people had said over the years, I, I'm not sure how well they meant this, but they told me <laughs> I looked like Abraham Lincoln. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do a one-man show on Abraham Lincoln. So it's a little bit backwards. I, I first got the idea of doing a show and then decided on Lincoln. Uh, I'd always been a real Civil War buff ever since I was a little kid, and, and you know, knew a fair amount about Lincoln, so I had to do a bunch of research. I found uh, incidents in his life, speeches, of course, uh, letters, that I could uh, do at a one-man show where I wouldn't need to speak to anybody else or didn't have to be anybody else up on stage with me. So, so that's what I did. I put that together then. Oh, wow. And I know you were in a theater group, you told me, right? So... What was so controversial about what you were doing for that? Again, a bunch of 
Mm. And a lot of them kind of agreed with us that this is a problem for them. Other people were offended. Okay, so almost kind of like a roast kind of a little bit, maybe? or uh, We would do skits. Mm -hmm. uh, we would do skits and... Um, and uh, well, here, here's an example. We would also have this uh, very sweet woman in the uh, cast come up and do what she called Word for the Day. And uh, these were very conservative churches. They somehow had the notion that you should never have a musical instrument in church. All singing should be done a cappella. Oh, wow. My feeling is if you decide you want to do everything a cappella, that's fine. But, you know, don't try to make a sin or something out of having an uh, uh, instrument in church. Anyway, she got yeah. up there and said, yeah. Um, hmm. uh, you know, I can't know. I, I take that one back. I can't remember all that. But, but she... They, they also, the sanctuaries, they just called it the auditorium. And at some point, I guess that's cool. You know, any place you can consider sacred. And so she gets up there and says, word for the day is, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the sanctuary, uh, a word for auditorium used by the godless Presbyterians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that always got a laugh. Yeah. Well, it, was kind of long, it was kind of along the lines of, ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How'd you get the how'd you get the role of honest Abe in librarians? Did you just um, answer an ad, or do you have management go, hey, you're the guy? Uh, they're doing this. Neither. They, uh, as you will recall, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a segment where they wanted to use some uh, Civil War reenactors mm -hmm. to uh, do a battle, and they said, oh, by the way, uh, we would like to do this scene where there's a parade and a guy is dressed as Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. and yeah. the Civil War reenactors. That's a group I've worked. I almost didn't get. It. I got it, and my management at the time was like trying to get me, get it for me and stuff. Uh, playing uh -huh. a uh, was it General Carlton Loveday or well, a reenactor. I run from the yeah. CGI ghost of the real Carlton Loveday in the story, but uh, I almost didn't get it because I uh, my size thirteen feet uh, wouldn't fit in their whatever historically accurate whatever size they had a boot. Yeah, and then I was like, well, I could bring some, you know, this, and like looking at pictures and pictures, like, well, that could pass, you know. I mean, I'm almost thinking, like, now in hindsight, well, I'm playing a reenactor. It's almost like I could have had Chuck Taylor's. It would have been funny almost. But, but yeah. But, uh, no, yeah, it all worked out. Yeah, and I'm glad I met well, you. I'm glad. And, I'm glad because yeah. you did a nice job, and I had fun meeting you uh, doing that. Um, and and I, you know, I, I understand the episode it was well received, so we, we all done good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, with the right, with the strike, I won't say what platform it's on, but yeah, I've got a lot of people notice me and digging it from that, and it sounds like you did as well. Did you meet uh, any, yeah. Did you meet any of the cast, the main cast, like Rebecca Romaine or any of those people? Makeup show. Uh, 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 Rebecca Romaine was the. She was the guest star. She was uh, one of the stars of the show. Uh, one of the um, blonde. Oh, she was like an X Men and stuff. Or. Oh yes, yes. Uh, no, I mostly chatted with. Saturday Night Live, who oh, yeah. Saturday Night Live for several years, oh, and I yeah. and I were walking together in uh, this, this parade, so of course there's a lot of downtime where we're standing there waiting for uh, the scene to shoot, and she was and she was really a delight to talk to, and that was one of the highlights uh, of, of doing it, yeah. yeah she I didn't actually interact with any of the three main stars. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that was a super fun and experience. I guess you did. Oh, yeah, they had to glue on this, um, I had to shave my beard, which, at least my beard now, it looks like the beard I had then, the fake beard, but I had a beard that I shaved for them to put a fake beard on, and a pin on a wig, and some oh, war cap. Funny, yeah, so I'd be next to them. And, they would have you shave your beard off so that you could put on a beard. Yeah, it's kind of, I can't remember what my facial hair was, but I remember being kind of pissed at the time, like, or annoyed, like, oh, I gotta shave my facial, and then, like, they put on a full beard that's somewhat similar to my beard at the time, like, okay, <laughs> And there was a colleague of ours in that scene who also had a fake mustache. Oh, yeah? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 in between shots. And it wasn't, it wasn't anchored real well. 
So like it's so it's kind of ironic that you played Abe Lincoln when you've had such a political career. Cause I know you served for several years as a legislative staffer for the United States Congress. Yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that was the job I enjoyed the most. You know, I was a foreign service officer, a diplomat for for many years. That's the career I retired from. But I, I really enjoyed uh, working for the Congress. Uh, later on, <laughs> the Congress I worked for got itself just elected. And, uh, all of us on the staff realized, hmm, this may have been partly my fault. I could have done a better job, you know. <laughs> but I ended up, <laughs> yeah, uh, I ended up working for the uh, Oregon State Senate. And at one point, I, at one point, I called over to the Judiciary Committee because I wanted to know the uh, committee vote on a certain bill. You know, none of the legislators have time to read all these bills. Uh, most folks don't really understand that. They, you just you haven't got the time. And so if the bill is coming up on the floor, uh, you can read the summary, but it doesn't tell you very much. And so what you can do is you can call up the committee, ask what the committee vote was. And you know the people on the committee, and those you tend to agree with, and their votes will tell you a lot about whether this is a bill you want to support or not. And so I called over there to the committee and uh, spoke to the uh, uh, council, chief counsel to the committee, uh, Ms. Gnievosh. And I said, uh, Ms. Gnievosh, uh, could you tell me the committee vote on Senate Bill 248 or whatever it was. And she politely replied, I haven't got time for that. If you want to find out what the committee vote was, you can go over here and look it up yourself. Whoa. Is that what? Yeah. Well, this is how and a friend of mine used to say, that was a slap in the face with a wet fish. But the bottom line on that is I ended up marrying her. Uh, <laughs> oh. Not, yeah. Not because of that incident, mind you. I'm not yeah. a physicist. You said you went also into Mexico and, of course, Washington, D.C., yeah. right? Wow. Yeah, they made me go to Paris for my first post. Oh. Know, for, for me uh, but that was a short one. I was a trainee, so I only got to spend a year there. Uh, the, the irony was that Felicia and I, my wife and I, hmm. uh, you know, you make sometimes promises before you get married about how things are going to be. Yeah. And the only promise we made to ourselves was that somehow, some way, we'd live in Paris for a year. And, and so a year and a half later, uh, two years later, there we were, mm. and we began to realize that what I really meant was uh, live in Paris for a year without having to work, because that <laughs> ends up taking up all your time. Oh anyway. my goodness. So uh, that was a real, a real privilege, and I yeah. wanted to come home and uh, and write, and I wanted to write seriously, <laughs> and uh, so I continued to scribble away while I was looking for an agent. That proved to be the hardest part. That took me ten years uh, to get an agent. And uh, in the meantime, I'd written four novels, and uh, it was great because she got me a uh, three-novel uh, contract with a very small publishing company, but I was very pleased. And uh, there was no pressure because they wanted three books. I already had three books. Uh, there wasn't going to be a lot of pressure. 
pressure on me to get it done in time. Uh, mm. I just handed them out as, as one got published, and the next year they wanted another one, and the next year they wanted another one, while I was writing on other things. So I've got, I've got four out there, for those of you who are listening who might be interested. Mm. Uh, you can find them under Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Holgate, H-O-L-G-A-T-E. I hope you don't mind me. No, but no plug away, yeah. Out. Yeah, I mean, you published um, several novels. I mean, you won the Silver Medal in Fiction and been nominated for Book of the Year by the Forward Review, plus you won a coveted Start Review from Publishers Weekly. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean... It, it's really gratifying. Uh, you know, the people have really liked them. I, this is my dream since I was in fourth grade, uh, was to be a writer. Mm. And so to be able to do that and then have people really think they're good, that, that's terrific. Oh, cool. uh, I only wish sales were better. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's your top seller? Uh, probably a book called Tangier. That was the first mm. one I published. And uh, I was based in Rabat when I was in Morocco. But we used to go up to Tangier fairly often. And I would tell people. And then I, I realized, why don't I just put it in the book? It was actually one of the last editions I had of the book. I stuck it in about page 10. That uh, Casablanca... Uh, the real city is nothing like Casablanca in the movie. Oh, but, yeah. but Tangier is. Huh. Uh, you can still get yourself in a lot of trouble in Tangier in a oh. big hurry. Uh, it's, it's still kind of a seedy, uh, in, intrigue-filled place. And mm. uh, I was trying to bring that across. It's kind of a two-part story. I hope I'm not boring people. No. In one, uh, a guy... Uh, he was in his 50s, he'd been caught up in a scandal in Washington, lost his position, he's kind of a bitter man. And he never knew his father. His father was a Frenchman. Uh, he and his mother had been evacuated to the United States before, uh, as the war started, so he never knew his father, who apparently died in a uh, French prison because of his opposition to the Nazis. And now, 50 years later, it turns out that his mother has just received a long-delayed letter showing that he was in Tangier when they thought he was in prison. And he's in a lot of trouble in Tangier that he doesn't specify. So this guy's 80-year-old mother browbeats him into going to Tangier to see if he can find his father. Uh, you know, he's not all sure he can. And then in uh, alternating sections, we follow the father and how he came to Tangier and fell in with a nest of spies or a lot of spies in Tangier in World War II because the city didn't belong to anybody. It wasn't part of Morocco. The French didn't own it. The Spanish didn't own it. Nobody owned it. It was a free city. And so well, and it's in a strategic location right on the Straits of Gibraltar. So there were lots of spies there because you're not breaking anybody's laws. Uh, and I actually got to know uh, a guy in his 90s who had been a spy in Tangier with the OSS during the World War, World War II, uh, OSS being the precursor to the CIA. And he was full of stories. He was, he was great fun. And I actually was able to fit one or two of the stories into, the, into my book. So uh, it was a, a, enjoyable to write, enjoyable to do a little research, and enjoyable to revisit my memories of being in, in Tangier. Yeah, geez. It's almost like uh, Ian Fleming. It sounds kind of like with your you know, military ex political experience, right? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. And, uh, and in fact, he told me a story about a British spy. Ian Fleming had been with uh, British intelligence, mm -hmm. naval intelligence during World War II. And uh, this guy, his name is Gordon Sand, uh, told me about a British spy who was a homicidal maniac. And huh. he would invite, you, 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 you knew who the spies were on the other side, or you knew most of them. You, you all knew who each other were, but it was kind of an agreement. Uh, uh, he was telling me, uh, uh, Gordon was telling me, because uh, if you start killing each other, one, it just asks. Retribution to get yourself killed. Okay. And two, huh. it was easier when you knew who the other guy's spies were. If you killed one of them, huh. you'd be replaced by somebody. You wouldn't know somebody oh. for months. So they'd be like, yeah, you'd much. be able to still act within the system within reason. Yeah. I guess. Wow, that's it, interesting. It was kind of a gentleman's agreement huh. among them. And this, this British guy would invite, you know, an Italian and a German over. He'd poison them, kill them dead. And it was making all kinds of problems. As you can imagine, this almost sounds like a comedy. Yeah. And Gordon got a hold of British intelligence and said, you've got to get this guy out of here. That's funny. Yeah. That's crazy that he's like this berserker. It's like that in this kind of world of danger. It's like, well, no, this guy's too much. He's a loose cannon. Or It's just kind of yeah. wild. Huh. Yeah. 
And, wow. and so he got the guy uh, evacuated out of there and sent back to London. Years later, Gordon retired to uh, Tangier because it's a, a very agreeable place to live. And he's walking down the street with his wife, mm -hmm. and he run into this same British spy mm -hmm. and come back to Tangier too. And, and you know, this British spy knew it was Gordon who had him sent home. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, well, no hard feelings, uh, Gordon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's all blank sign. Uh, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, would you and your wife like to come over for drinks? <laughs> There's no way in the world. Hell no. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know you. You'll kill us. Oh, yeah. my uh, God. So, and I actually may kind of make use of that character, the British spy, and, and put him in my home. So, yeah, had a lot of, I, I, as I say, got to meet a lot of interesting people. Inspired by, for lot, sure. But I learned about this extraordinary place. Right, what you know, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and exactly. And then I, I did one uh, on uh, Sri Lanka, uh, where we spent a couple of years. Is that one called so Sri Lanka, or no? What's the one called? Yeah, that's called oh, Sri Lanka. Okay. <laughs> They're just place names. I see, I see the, <laughs> I see the system now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oh. then I followed it up with uh, a one called uh, To Live and Die in a Floating World, a little longer title. Mm. And The love triangle, not the murder, or what part did you leave out or change? Sexual tension, yeah. but he does, they don't act on it. But there's the danger of what happened in reality. Oh, I don't want to give it all away. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Like you have to buy the book. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's called uh, To Live and Die in the Floating World. Wow. And again, it was fun to revisit that time on the boat and remember what that was like. People ask me if I do research, and mostly what I do is get out my old photo albums and I flip through the pages, and it all starts coming back to you. Mm. Not
write stories that wouldn't happen somewhere else. Mm. You know, a Tangier, well, that happened, described it, that could only happen in Tangier. Madagascar, mm. for sure, could only happen in Madagascar. Mm. Yeah, I love all this. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I see comedy, I see espionage, I see danger, I see, it almost uh, kind of feels like a... Uh, White Lotus, almost in a way. Like, have you ever made uh, screenplays of any of these, or any aspirations for that? Because uh, these would be great series. And I kind of show them to show them to him. I said, "What do you think? Uh, you want to work on this together?" But yeah. uh, it never seems to work out. And wow. that's okay. Although oddly enough, I, I write in a very visual way, and mm-hmm. so people say, oh, "Gosh, they seem like movies." But you yeah. know, there's probably not going to be a big audience for a movie set in Madagascar or Sri Lanka. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's just strange for people. All the Bond uh, films and Mission Impossible blew up recently again with that, uh, part, what, seven or something like that? And something like that, yeah. And uh, I haven't, I haven't seen, you might have to change the title or alter it slightly because there's that, um, I haven't seen it, but I have, a, I have a nephew, a little a child nephew who watches uh, Madagascar that animated, there's like that, you know, yeah, like Pixar yeah. or Disney animated film. So you yeah, might have to slightly yeah, change I the title if you make I've a book of it. it. Yeah, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> I understand that these are animals let loose when a, mm. a, a ship taking them to the zoo where it crashes. Oh, there's the, okay, yeah. But mm. it's, a, it's a fascinating place. There's, there's no place like it. Huh. Uh, and, and they have what we think are very peculiar customs, but then it can they think we're really peculiar, too. Uh, They're probably right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they are right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> superstitious there and wow and huh did anything happen where people did it seem like it was possibly real at all did anything occur oh yeah a lot of them a lot of them really believed this yeah and and so what we did and you don't tell washington uh you know that you're having religious figures come in and do a blessing of the uh, the, uh, remodeling but what we were but you do yeah just it was a So they probably made a real show of it just so everyone saw it and heard about it and talked about it, right? Just so exactly. people would be comfortable. Wow. Exactly, yeah. That is yeah, wild. Yeah. And uh, I try to fit a lot of that into the book and make it part of the plot. Um, yeah. Because it's such a peculiar place. And a lot of the things I, I, I saw and learned, uh, I just didn't have time to put all of it in or I didn't have a way of working it into the story. It's remarkable place. People are always doing TV specials about the flora and fauna of Madagascar, which are really quite unique. Hmm. But I was more fascinated with the culture. Uh, One of the things they do is uh, they greatly reverence the ancestors and they put them in tombs and every seven years or so, they've been a little bit on which try, they they disinter them, bring them out, uh, change their And, and wrap them back up and put them back in the tomb. Huh. Uh, and the spirit really of cool. the ancestors is always over your shoulder uh, and being very judgmental. So it makes for kind of a, uh, a sad atmosphere in the place because they're always being judged by their, their ancestors. And it seems like the ancestors are never happy. <laughs> so it adds to very nice people, very nice people. But there's a little bit of a gloomy feel to the place. Huh. Like I, 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 yeah, like I visited my grandma's grave uh, recently. I, you know, I talked to her, and then and my uncle that was next to her, you know, in the grave next to her. And like, uh, but yeah, I mean, my grandma at times was judgmental, but I didn't, 
it's funny how people different customs are different different cultures are different because like I didn't I didn't dwell on you know her uh, being judgmental like that I just kind of talked to her and being supportive it's almost like you know you're talking to yourself you're talking to them you know so it's huh that's interesting well, that you also don't feel that quite literally the spirit of your ancestors is on your shoulder looking over your shoulder yeah. and judging you every minute of the day I mean we just we don't believe that you know hmm like almost like a like a boogeyman or something like to keep you in line with what you should be doing, kind of or what? Yeah, I'm not uh, sure. If boogeyman is the right term. Although mm. it doesn't kind of close that, but yes, they're yep. trying to keep you in line, making yeah. sure that you follow tradition. Tradition, huh. boy, we think we've got traditions. We are nothing like them. Uh, for instance, we had uh, our uh, uh, development agency, which is you know to help other countries, uh, you know, that are developing to improve their economy, and they brought in a strain of rice. They're, uh, their main staple there is rice, and they grow a particular kind of rice where they keep out having to burn down the forests to make new rice paddies because uh, this particular brand of rice will exhaust the soil in just a couple of years. And so we brought one in that would have much higher yields and that you could use them every year for years. And, and they said, oh, this is wonderful. This is really terrific. But we can't do this. And, and our AID guy, Asian Yeah. Well, our ancestors grew this kind of rice, so we must grow this huh. kind of rice. Wow. And they knew it was a better idea, but they can't do it. I mean, I'm sure there are a few who would change, huh. most would not. You gotta it's respect that in a way. I mean, even that's not good uh, business. <laughs> but I mean, uh, yeah. wow. Huh. Yeah, unfortunately, they're, they're destroying their environment this way. Uh, in Madagascar, probably the last place in the world to have a, its own population, people probably came there, they said, about 500 AD. And, and they're really essentially destroying their environment already, which is should be a big warning to us. Even if we do it slightly slower, it can happen, man. It can yeah. happen. Yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, it's like they say, um, what the expressions, you probably know it's from, where they say, you don't, you never truly, a person never dies until the last person forgets them. And well, there, that's never going to happen. If they're over, always right. over your shoulder, you're not even, even business wise, you're keeping those fields. You always yeah. will be remembered, yeah. Yeah. It's not exactly right name. They're all vaguely aware. Well, it was a funny thing. I, I was saying to a Malagasy friend, I said, well, you, you know, the tomb must get full after a while. What do you do? He said, oh, we just take the oldest bones to over the creek. <laughs> really? <laughs> Are you joking so or no? After all those years of remembrance, for Whoa. the funny they, they just toss your bones in the river and let it go. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, funny thing. But, yes, that, that phrase is... Uh, is, a, is an interesting one, and I hadn't really thought, yeah, in some ways it doesn't apply to Madagascar, because you're always remembered, at least. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And I take all this home with me, and I felt, it, it may sound strange, but I felt an obligation to share what I had learned. And so the novels, to a great degree, are that attempt of mine to, to share with people what, what they paid me to do. Uh, you know, they paid me to go overseas and learn all this. And so I felt kind of an obligation to to share what I had learned. And I said, here's what I learned with all those privileges you gave me. Huh. Yeah. You got so many great stories from it. Not just uh, oh, yeah, life stories, yeah, but what yeah. you could put into writing. So that's so cool. And, uh, yeah, I'm a storyteller. I'll, I'll go on all day just telling you one story after another. But, you know, you go to these places where fantastical things happen. Oh, you're, you're always sick over there, like, what, just from uh, the food or the environment or what? Uh, mostly, yeah, you, you might drink something or you eat hmm. something that seems fine, but then it turns out it's not. And I got amoebas. I haven't been there very long at all, about two months. And uh, if you can imagine me, six foot three hmm. and weighed about 145 pounds. Huh. Uh, and so that was no fun. Uh, hmm. and, and so I got over it. They gave me some medicine finally to get over the amoebas. But I, I never was able to put the weight back on as long as I was there. I came home and just started eating everything in sight, and I put on 23 pounds in two months. I was having a great time. Oh, back in, in Washington, D.C., or where were you back? In Oregon? or? Yeah, well, I went back to D.C. Um, oh, yeah. After Madagascar, uh, they taught me Arabic uh, before going to Morocco. Wow. I spent 10 months. 
Oh yeah, and and I. You sure you weren't a spy? You really you weren't a spy because you you had such a life. Jeez. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's like. Are you a spy? Are you an immortal with all these all this life experience or both? <laughs> yeah, and, and you know I, I knew some of those folks uh, at the embassies, but you know I never mm. and some of them were real friends, but I never asked them what they did. I had a vague notion. Oh yeah, they probably can't say. Uh, wow. Well, they could have shared some of it with. Is me, there a general code? For, is there ever a general code them, but, for what they say? Like I'm a photographer. A lot of them say they're a certain thing that you kind of know. Uh, I don't want to get too much oh, into it. Yeah, but, you get in trouble. Uh, yeah, don't get me in trouble. Friends, <laughs> I never, I never wanted to know what they were doing, mm. so it just remained a friendship. Oh, okay. And, uh, and some of them were real good friends, but I, I never asked, I never wanted to know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always tell people, well, somebody's got to do the real work. And uh, I really enjoyed what I was doing. I thought it was the most interesting job in the embassy, you know, to work with the press and work with universities uh, and, and uh, sometimes artistic groups. Uh, I, I enjoyed that. Hmm. Odyssey, you know. <laughs> In a sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Along with my wife and uh, uh, our, our, we had a four-month-old, five-month-old when we first started, and then oh. we another one while we were doing that. So the kids were along for all this too. And Felicia never slapped you with a fish, like uh, she said in the phone call. No. <laughs> all these years. I would have been lucky on that. Oh. <laughs> no, she she took it as a trooper. Usually worked for the embassy herself. Um, but we were all ready. Talk about Portland. Uh, you served as an overseas correspondent for Portland Radio. So, when was that? Oh yeah. Well, it, it was while well, I was working for this congressman. I took a six-month leave of absence. I'd always wanted to travel overseas, uh, and uh, so I saved up my money the whole time I was working for him. You know, you don't get paid much as a congressional staff. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. uh, saved it all up and uh, uh, kicked around Europe for six months. But I had been doing press work for the congressman, so I asked. It was on FM radio, KKFN radio, which isn't around anymore. Mm. But I said, hey, uh, how would you like it if I uh, did uh, cassette tapes back then, if I would do okay. you know, occasional cassette uh, articles and send them to you in the mail? And they said, yeah, sure. And they paid me a pittance for it, but it was kind of fun, and they, they used them all. Uh, mm. So it, a lot of my friends heard me on KKSN talking about all the things. Again, I was learning going overseas. And where does that fall in line with um, when you manage two political campaigns? I know you did that. That was, let's see, that uh, worked for Congress, uh, 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 lost my job when he got uh, uh, defeated, and so oh, we went here for a while. Worked for the state senate when I came back, but back then particularly, it only meant six months every two years. And uh, so you can't make a career out of that, but the senator I worked for decided to run for statewide office asked me if I would manage the campaign. I said, so I don't know anything about running a campaign. Mm -hmm. But uh, he talked me into it, and uh, and we lost. And I thought, 
よ。<笑>
and uh, they'll, they'll do things without thinking. Uh, uh. National Geographic put it well about Morocco. It's, it's, it's unnerving uh, driving on highways with people who've clearly made their peace with God. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh. huh. And so, yeah, that's the big killer for us of imposters is traffic accidents. Even to this day, or...? I suspect that hasn't changed a whole bunch. Hmm. That's fascinating. But again, you know, it's, maybe it's the second generation, but... Yeah, uh, well, might as well, be, might as well be the first, or even, like, three steps back with uh, technology, all the distractions, you know, and... Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's and smartphones they, over there. They, they leap into things, you know. Uh, like, cell phones were much more common overseas in, in developing countries than they were here for a while. Hmm. Uh, because we had a regular phone system. They didn't have a phone system Ooh, they could so, rely on. So it's a race so to get it, like, why not? just a godsend to them. And they adapted them, adopted them uh, much more quickly than we did right at first. Huh. So, so, yeah, it's a funny thing. You know, they, they get to buy powerful cars straight off, you know, uh, oh, which is part of the problem. And the better the roads, the more dangerous it gets. I mean, if you're only going 20 miles an hour, you know, you're probably not going to manage to kill yourself or somebody else. But if you're driving 60 and you're not paying attention, yeah, you know, a lot of people are going to die. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I don't want to make it sound too awfully. Steve, you also headed up an environmental group with the City Club of Portland, working with Climate Reality. Um, what are some, I mean, probably many things, but we need to do to lessen the harshness of climate change, in your opinion, or maybe if it's not too late yeah, at this uh, point? Yeah, those are some <laughs> different things. So City Club was very active. I mm. headed up a little mm. subgroup they had on the environment, but they, they uh, folded that and a lot of things up, and mm. so I started working with Climate Reality after that. You know, the simplest thing to say is we've got to get the carbon. Uh, out of our economy. Uh, we run on petroleum, we run on uh, um, coal, and we've, we've got to stop. We've just got to stop. Most people, even who, who believe that climate change is a real problem, don't quite realize how dire the effects are going to be if we don't hurry up. Uh, find ways around the house to uh, mow your, your threshold. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, get uh, heat pumps instead of your instead of, you know, say, gas uh, power, you know, gas uh, heating, you know, mm-hmm. use the heat pump, uh, buy a hybrid car, a plug-in hybrid, or, or an electric uh, vehicle, and, t- t- you know, if, uh, talk to your office holders, write, write a letter, if nothing else, you're letting them know, hey, you've got the political cover to make tough decisions, we will support you on this, and that makes a big difference to office holders, you know, that, okay, I've got, I've got my people behind me on this, I can take some risks. But, you know, talk to other people. Just make it clear that this is a real problem. We've, we've got to act promptly. That, that's a lot of it, just raising awareness to make it possible with public opinion to take the dramatic steps that we need to take. Uh, you know, and it won't, be, it won't be that nobody's ever going to have any fun anymore, that we have to uh, all hide in a dark room uh, and not turn on the heat. But we've got to find better ways of doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and do it very, very rapidly. Yeah. Uh, you know, and for somebody like me, I do it for my kids and for my grandson. Uh, I, I won't see the worst effects of it, but they will. Yeah, I mean, so there's still and a world to save. You, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is, this is what you do to make a better world for the people that come after you. And, and we've got to hurry. We, we, we can't be sitting here thinking, well, is this the way to do it? Do we really need to do this? And don't listen to the people who say this isn't a problem. Uh, read the science. It's yeah, it's crazy how, like, we're still dealing with it so much. I remember when I was a kid, and, you know, I'm still pretty young, but I'm not a spring chicken. I remember as a kid, like, on, like, you know, they used to have little public surface messages at the end of cartoons, like G.I. Joe and I think even He-Man and stuff like that, and Captain Planet, you know, where make sure you turn yeah. off the light when you leave the room, kids, and stuff like that, and make sure the water's not running, you know, that the sink's not dripping, and it just seems so yeah. crazy we're still having these... Yeah, and these are tiny yeah. measures to take, but, you know, one thing they do is they instill a certain frame of mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not turning off this light because if I leave the light on, the world's going to end, but I'm turning off this light to remind me mm-hmm. uh, that this is a serious issue. Yeah. Uh, you know, you just get into bad... Uh, good, well, you all get into bad habits, too. Somebody said a bad habit is just as easy to get into as a good one. Um, 
it's a very good habit. It's just as easy to get into as a bad one. Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, do those things to remind yourself. Uh, you know, yeah, we've we've got to do something. You know, put put solar panels in. There are so many uh, federal grants available now for mm-hmm. putting in heat pumps, solar panels, uh, other you know, uh, uh, buying an electric car or a plug-in hybrid. Uh, a lot of money out there for people to do these things, and. Uh, they're tax credits, not just tax deductions. So you get the money back, mm. a lot of it. And uh, you know that—that's another thing people need to be more aware of. Oh, so. cool. Yeah, I'm glad. That, I'm glad electric vehicles are more popular than ever before. I remember there was that "Who Killed the Electric Car" documentary a while ago, and I remember when they were first kind of coming out, looking kind of cool and futuristic, and then all of a sudden they were just gone. And now, you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, we've got one. We've got a Chevy Bolt. Mm. Uh, you know, oh, cool. Bolt with a B as in boy. It's great fun to drive. Yeah. You know, it really appeals to the 18-year-old in you. Uh, the one thing they warn you about when you buy the car is if you're used to flooring you know, the accelerator when the light turns red, you've got to knock that off because this thing will accelerate like a rocket. Wow, yeah. And in fact, yeah, the torque is so... <laughs> I shouldn't be talking like this. Oh, yeah. The torque is, <laughs> is so big when you floor it that the car will actually hop around left and right in your lane. Uh, you've got to constantly adjust as you're flooring it because it's, it's jumping all over the lane on you. Huh. Uh, but also, you know, the range on them is so much better than it used to be. Uh, it depends on the, on the weather, but in summer, uh, we can go about 300 miles before we oh. need to charge. And, and the chargers are faster than they used to be. Uh, and, and, the, and so it's, you know, unless you're taking a long trip, you don't really need to use a charger most of the time. You know, what do you think about most yeah. of the cars in the garage? And even, even and so, there's the hybrids. I mean, so there's almost no excuse to not have at least a hybrid, if not electric, yeah. you know, when you're in your next vehicle. I mean, I, you know. yeah, yeah, we for might sure. want to plug in hybrid, which have a lot to say for them, but oh. there was this huge sale on the Bolt, so we got that instead. Oh. But we just plug it into the uh, wall socket in the garage. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah you don't need a special charger. Oh. And, uh, and, it's great, you know, uh, and the estimates are that these uh, batteries will probably last a couple hundred thousand miles, uh, and, and you replace it, you know, it, it would be expensive, but not horribly expensive. I mean, we bought the car for 23000 mm-hmm. by the time, you know, we had tax credits and uh, a great price off on the car. Credits, so you're not uh, spending money on, yeah, you're not spending money on gas, yeah. Couldn't be that much to just replace the batteries. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 we, we've had a lot of fun driving this car, to tell you the truth. That's what people don't quite realize about them. They don't realize that the range is much greater than they think it is. Uh, it's easier to charge than a lot of people think. And they're, they're great fun to drive. And there are more charging stations than ever before in places. You know, I feel like every grocery yeah. store and mall has them, it seems like. So, yeah. yeah. And they're faster chargers than they used to be. Hmm. Uh, you can get what they call a level two charger. And you get about 25 miles of range back for every hour you're plugged in. But more and more, they are fast chargers. And in an hour, you know, you go taking a trip to go in. What we do is uh, heading down to Ashland. We'll stop at Roseburg, have lunch, and the car is plugged into a fast charger. And in an hour, it'll get about 100 miles of range back. Oh, and, cool. Uh, so you just stop for a while and go on to Ashland and then plug oh. it in when you get back. I wonder if they'll make... You know, we haven't had to stop. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't care what the price of gas is to a great extent. Mm-hmm. Except when we rented a car or, you know, oh, I, yeah. I drive a friend to the hospital now and again. Uh, we don't care what the price of gas is. We haven't gotten into a gas station in four years. Oh. So there's that to be said for it, too. See, it's a VIP feel, too. <laughs> so a little perk <laughs> of saving the environment, you know? Huh? Yeah. Or doing so your part to save the environment. Yeah. But there are economic reasons for buy, buying it. In the long run, it's cheaper than having a, an internal combustion car. Hmm. Uh, within, you know, three, four, five years, uh, you're better off having bought that electric vehicle. Hmm. I wonder if the, I wonder what the next level is after that. If, 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 ele- if electrical be the most efficient vehicle, I remember as a kid I envisioned like uh, having a, some sort of wind up car, like some sort of super, super yeah. piston winding up. You know. <laughs> uh, the next step is hydrogen. Uh, oh yeah. The Japanese uh, are really going to hydrogen fairly quickly, much faster oh. than we. I mean, you don't see hydrogen cars there, but they're they're getting more common there because uh, you know to charge in you need electricity. And for them... So how would that uh, work, in theory, or totally? Uh, you, I can't, 
Mm. The, the trick is to make sure that the, as you're creating hydrogen, mm. that you're not using up more energy than you get out of it. Mm -hmm. And they're still working on that. They're, they are starting to break even on that. And, mm. uh, and the hydrogen car, uh, your your emission is water. You know, a little bit of a little bit of uh, water vapor. That's mm. what you emit. Like, uh, like so hot steam is, coming out of a vent, maybe? Maybe vents coming out the back or something? I wonder. Yeah, I, I haven't seen one myself, but I know they are available. You can buy hydrogen cars. Uh, oh, really? Charging. Yeah, there are some oh. charging stations in California. And, uh, and in Japan, uh, you know, they're, they're really concentrating on advancing hydrogen cars. Uh, really wow. More than they are electric cars, because they know this is the next step. Uh, huh. So, it would, you know, it would feel good that you're going around... In a car that rather it takes energy to make it and takes mm. energy to make the hydrogen, but overall, you know, uh, you're greatly lowering the uh, uh, carbon footprint of what it takes to drive. I wonder, but do you know what would I? What would you have to buy to keep it running? Would you, or you just buy the car I, and it's good to go, or what? Because I wonder. I, I don't mm. know enough about the hydrogen cars. Mm. Uh, I, I know they exist. I know Toyota mm. makes a model. I think Nissan makes a model, uh, but mostly they're in Japan. Um, well, yeah, I'm probably going to Google that. But any fans out there, uh, hit me up on the Patreon or any of my sites because I'm, I'm yeah. very curious about this. i got to check this out, Doc. One of the nice things about <laughs> the electric car, too, and the hydrogen car would be even more so, hmm. is how few moving parts there are. You only have a fraction of the moving parts you have in a hmm. regular car. So, you know, I don't have to worry about uh, getting a hole in the oil tank. There yeah. is no oil. Uh, there's yeah. no gas pump. There's no oil not pump. Not this breaking uh, down, not that breaking down, yeah. hope you know because I, I remember i've made this joke for a while like when i was a kid the future was like hoverboards and flying cars and now the future is like you know the apocalypse and which some people say we're in you know and if we're gonna the earth is gonna be started. gone we're going to mars you know or something like that if we have to you know because geez yeah we can go yeah. mess up another planet yeah um, okay yeah <laughs> although i've got to think that the money we would put into that if that was our motivation was to colonize another planet we'd be better off spending it here and trying to find out a way to cure our ills rather than just abandon oh, yeah. them. Uh, there are ways now of capturing carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, they haven't ramped them up. There's no... Uh, they haven't scaled it up where it's really worth it yet, but they're working very, very quickly on trying to do that. And, and I think that's what it's going to take. We, we can cut down. We need to cut down on our carbon emissions, but I think it's too late to entirely rely mm. on that. I think we've got to start to I worry about that. Hope. Yeah, I'm almost afraid to sure. look let to research it because I'm like, oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? You know, I mean, you could feel yeah, it. The greenhouse be, effects I, I and tend not to yeah. read these uh, uh, alarming tales. I know the problem is really serious. Yeah, and I'm working with local governments and, and things like that to get them to take uh, climate change more seriously. I've worked with Beaver, Beaverton School District on some things, with uh, City of Tiger on some things, with uh, Washington County on some things. And, you know, it's just small incremental stuff I do, but that's what I can do. I'm doing it, you know. Yeah. So. Hmm. Another one of those very weird things that I can do. Right. Well, I'm thankful. Wow. Someone's got to do I'm it. I'm thankful yeah. I can do it. I'm yeah. Like I have this opportunity. Well, you're well versed, yeah, world traveler, so. so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been a strange life. I've really been very fortunate. Anything, any other goals on the horizon, uh, the writing, or what? What's what's the next huge yeah, thing I'm for Steve? Yeah, I'm going away right now on a story I've had in the back of my mind for literally mm. decades. Uh, about mm. a guy named Isaiah Dorman. He was a real person. Um, a black man who had gone out west. Uh, nobody's quite sure if he had escaped from slavery or he was freed at the end of the war. But he went out west, did various things in career uh, for the army, maybe a buffalo hunter. And uh, then he uh, lived with the Sioux for a number of years, had a Sioux wife. Mm. Uh, you know, everything we know about it, it fits into a long paragraph, so I get to make up the story. Mm. And, and so he, he's living with the Sioux, 
You f- you're it's filling in all the story. blanks. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And it's fiction, and I've got to make, you know, I'll make very clear that this is fiction. Yeah. It's based on a, on a real okay. person. And uh, so I, I'm scribbling away at that uh, these days. I've got a couple of others with my agent. Uh, one uh, set in Paris where a guy is trying to find uh, the illegitimate son of a friend of his who's dying because this dying friend wants him to uh, receive whatever wealth that he has when he dies, but he, he, he didn't know about this son until very recently. He didn't know he'd fathered a child out of wedlock, and so he's sending his friend to Paris to find him uh, on what little clues he has, and suddenly the, the people are trying to kill the friend, and he's beginning to think, you know, this dying guy, I'm beginning to think there are some things he didn't tell me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one I've got with my agents, and the other one, <laughs> another part of my varied life is uh, right after I graduated from college, yeah, I'm a theater major, who wants me? And uh, my first job out of college was being a gardener for a couple of doctors in Malibu. Uh, they haven't managed to build their house yet, so we were living on this acre of ground. They, they had cleaned out a horse stable for themselves. They made a very nice little bedroom out of it. I had a tent. And uh, the two boys that I looked after, uh, in addition to doing the gardening, uh, there was this ramshackle uh, little trailer they pulled out of the property that had no heat and... Uh, and uh, no toilet, so we had we had to be the last family in Malibu that used an outhouse. Oh my but gosh! It, it was a wonderful summer, you know. It, it really was great. I had a wonderful time. <laughs> and they, they got the house built. And they asked me back for the the next summer. I was in grad school by then. They said, ah, "Come on, come back for another summer." They really, I really became like part of the family. And uh, they both passed away. Both doctors passed away. But I stayed mm. in touch with one of the kids. One of the kids died of cancer a number of years mm. ago. But I stay in touch with the other one, who ended up, uh, uh, Brent Forrester is his name, he ended up being a, uh, uh, a writer, head writer for a while on The Simpsons and mm-hmm. The Office, and uh, been a showrunner, so he, he's really done well. I knew him best when he was eight years old, but we stay in touch. I still go visit him now and again. Wow. I like to stay in touch with people. Yeah. Well, shout out to him. Is he in California, or is he in, uh... Yeah. 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 He's still in Malibu? Oh. Malibu? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Was he working on anything? Well, there's a big strike going on now. But was he is he working on was he working on anything recently? Or? Yeah, yeah, he he has some projects. I mean, he can mm-hmm. write. You just can't turn it over to anybody. But that's okay. You're mm-hmm. a writer. You just write, and when the time mm-hmm. comes, you're ready to go. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, he's got a couple of projects going on, and uh, he's hopeful about them. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I feel like you, way. yeah. You, you haven't thought about doing anything with him uh, with all your many 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 stories, or not really. Or? Um, Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and he's read a couple of my books, and I, I thought, you yeah, know, maybe one of these days he'll, he'll want to work on something. In fact, mm-hmm. I gave him an idea the other day that I'm not sure I'm capable of writing, that what would happen if AI were programmed to do everything it could to save the environment? Ooh. So what it does is start killing off every human being. As I was going to jokingly say, yeah, because that's kind of it's the, it's kind of the two plus two equals four thing to do. Oh, man. You're the problem. And oh, so, you know, like, you've got this this moral dilemma that hey, maybe AI, AI is right, we should let ourselves get wor- wiped out, but you know, that's really not part of our DNA. You know? yeah. so they need to stop it, uh, even though maybe for the planet it's doing the best thing it can, but uh, anyway, so I, I, yeah. I sent that to Brent and said, you know, yeah, maybe you want to do this. Oh. I got the There's something there. Oh, yeah, you yeah. <laughs> to really write that out. Huh. So, anyway, so yeah, this, uh, you know, I'm full of ideas. <laughs> And how is your podcast going? Oh, it's going great. Getting a lot of uh, cool people and stuff. Um, oh, that's great. I'm thinking I was more outside the box with uh, the, the writers and actor strikes. So, and there's uh, only I think only one that I've been sitting on. But other than that, I've been posting them all in the right order and everything, just making it clear that for certain uh, guests, that uh, it's definitely filmed before the writer strike. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's going super great. I'm doing I'm touring Las Vegas. I'm going. And, on the 22nd, so we're uh, retouring there with it, so it's going well enough for right, that. So now a lot of these are video then? Um, I'm, like, I'm video on video right now, but usually uh, that's just audio, the podcast itself. I but um, we have a YouTube companion show that on oh, average yeah. comes out like two, three weeks later, so, you know, pre-approved oh, wow. stuff uh, from the guest with like slideshow pictures or what have you. Oh, that's so, yeah. I, I, I was doing some as a writer, but I, I didn't see it was giving me a big boost, uh... And I can't remember the name under which. I mean, I it was Stephen Holgate, you know, with a PH. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did some YouTube stuff, and and I was kind of having fun getting a response. But I I, I wasn't adding a lot of people. Uh, you know, it's a literary thing, and maybe I, I didn't have the best ideas on how to do it. But it was kind of fun to do them. They're they're out there somewhere. Oh yeah. 
No, I'm digging it. Yeah, and I, I want, we chose to do this um, audio-wise, uh, not in studio, because then we get, um, we took, <laughs> well, I guess maybe I shouldn't say this one, because the podcast might jump on this, uh, this technique, but you get more guests, you get a higher yield of yeses um, from people when they know that they, they can just, you know, it's via phone call, you know, for the initial sure. podcast, because they're like, oh, I can be in my pajamas, I can, you know, I don't have to, like, do makeup or hair or whatever, you know, depending on the person, yeah, you know, I, so I, it's like, oh, cool. I don't have a joke anybody there, I sent you a message yeah, on yeah. Uh, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, oh, people can be last minute. So. Minute. Yeah, so. So have I given you what you need? Yeah, you've done super, and I've taken up enough of your time. So I thank you so much, Stephen Holgate, for everything you do, educating and entertaining us. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's my pleasure, Kevin. It's, very, it's great to talk to you again. Yeah, thank it was, you so much for thinking of me. Yeah, it was great. Well, it was great meeting you all those uh, years ago. Well, uh, not years and years ago, but uh, years ago on Librarians. And, five years. Yeah, we yeah connected on Facebook like right after and yeah. yeah. It's well, all good. Thanks, friend of me. Care, Kevin, yeah, friend I'm of the right. show. We actually ran into each other again. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, hey, I'm in a play actually. Ooh, yeah. Um, Plug the play. It's, it's an unpublished thing called Futura. Uh, we're doing it at the Key Coffee Shop um, in Beaverton, and it's it's interesting. It's a play of ideas. It's a little like uh, Fahrenheit 451. Ooh. Uh, Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'll send you a little something on it. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the dates for anyone who wants to? I mean, that's you give me some yeah, information. It is the uh, last uh, weekend in September, mm -hmm. which, let me look at the calendar here really fast, is 29th, 30th, yeah. and 31st. Uh, three performances at uh, 7 o'clock, 7.30, I should say. At, or maybe it's 7. <laughs> I hope I show up at the right <laughs> Cool. So everyone look into that. Get your tickets. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's good to, uh, I'll send you a little something good to order ahead of time. We've only got 20 seats. Oh, okay. And, uh, so uh, so there should still minutes. be some available at the door, yeah. but I'm not quite sure. So, oh, okay. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot, Steve. Okay, Kevin. You take care. You too. I'll be in touch. Thanks, bye man. Bye-bye. And we'll be right back after this brief message. This portion of that Kev One show is supported by Bohemian Dream Gifts, made with organic and natural oils that nourish and hydrate your skin. Man, I don't know if it's the weather outside or the gym that was killing my skin, because my right elbow on the, uh, it itched like the Dickens, like I've become like the lizard from Marvel Comics. Um, I think it's that machine where you put your elbow in and do the lifts, you know, for the bicep. But uh, I was itching my skin like crazy during, uh, well, I won't say who because I don't want them associated with rough skin with one of our guests <laughs> here in the near future here. <laughs> but my left, my right elbow was getting ashy and coming up, getting red and irritated. Anyway, I used some of the promotional cookie dough body oil from Bohemian Dream Gifts that they gave us. And my skin, I'm not kidding, came back. I can vouch for that one. The cookie dough oil baby body oil, the cookie dough body oil brought my skin back to life like an Evanescent song. I'm not kidding. My skin is smooth and happy again. 100%. You can buy cookie dough oil on Etsy at the Bohemian Dream Gifts shop. Check out their other stuff as well, but that's one that I that I swear by now. <laughs> and as soon as my promotional one runs out, I'm going to order some myself. So go to Etsy and visit the Bohemian Dream Gifts shop today. And now, back to the show. Thanks again to Steve Holgate. Check out his books. Check out his plays including the latest one in Beaverton this weekend. And to play us to Climax, I warmly welcome, with their addictive single, Loose Ends, Rip Room.